About 4 billion years ago, the first forms of life appeared on Earth, but the precise mechanism of how this occurred is still unknown. One proposed explanation for the origin of life is the fortunate event of lightning striking and giving energy to primordial soup. But what if it was not a matter of luck? What if life had no other alternative but to emerge? Usually we use biology or chemistry to try and answer this question, but what if we go deeper to the fundamental level? Does physics have something to say about the origin of life? In fact, the universe tends to increase in disorder and chaos. This is just the second law of thermodynamics, which says that the entropy of any isolated system always increases. But then, if the disorder increases, how is it possible that complex and ordered structures, such as DNA and cells, have formed? What are the fundamental physical processes involved? And what are the conditions required for life to appear? To answer these questions, we have Professor Sonia Antorans Contera, who is a researcher in the biophysics sub-department at the University of Oxford. Yeah, life is a thing that um, manages to keep uh, complicated and complex for a period of time. In order to be alive, um, you need energy. You need energy to keep your structure from disappearing. And you need a lot of information from the environment. You need to collect information from the environment and react to the changes in the environment. Because otherwise, you don't continue over time. How do we think that life started? Well, obviously, we don't know how life started. Um, one interesting thing is that the Earth is about 5 billion years old and life started on Earth pretty early on. So the, the fossil record shows bacteria, which are already quite complicated in fossils, were about 4, four billion years old, even more. Uh, so we don't know how life started, but we do know it started er very early after the earth appeared in the universe. Now some people think that maybe life in form of bacteria or something like that came from from out, outside the earth. That's one of the reasons why it might have started earlier. It might have come from somewhere else. That's one of the reasons why people are looking for life in Mars and places like that. We don't know where life came from. Traditionally there's been a lot of chemists looking at um, complex formation of complex molecules. What are the conditions for the formation of complex molecules that may end up into something that could be the beginning of life? But as a physicist, what I know is that you need a polymer to start life. So a polymer is a long molecule. Um, DNA is a polymer. Your proteins, we are made of nanostrings, small strings. So once you have a molecule, that is long enough and is in a medium that has some temperature, that molecule, maybe I bring a string here, the string of my, of my, of my mask. <laughs> so um, once you have a, a string and it's shaking and you're in the nanoscale and if there's some temperature, it will start, I, it will start dissipating energy. These strings uh, by the movement will change the structure. Now, if the structure endures over time, just by structure, means it's collecting some useful information about the environment. So in the shape, it's managed to collect information about the environment that allows it to keep going with the same shape. If you think about it, once you have a nanostring, you're already connecting energy with shape and information. The missing piece is that this string as soon as you have it in a chemical soup at some temperature and you start bending it because of external radiation, of mechanical movement, of whatever is happening, you're so small at the nanoscale that twists can facilitate binding of other molecules to you and the twist itself facilitates chemical reactions. So what happens is you're coupling mechanics and chemistry and you're coupling whatever external signal is coming in, which could be light or electrical fields. All these molecules, all the polymers, just because you are small and you are in water, you're charged. So you're coupling electricity, DNA is very highly charged, for example, electricity, mechanics, and chemistry at the nanoscale. So you already have the capacity to create a nanomachine 
as soon as you entangle yourself with the environment. So the environment creates shapes that are able to produce chemistry, change in the environment, that they're able to store information in the shape, and that they're able to also react to the environment through mechanics and electricity. So once you have a polymer, you start creating the capacity to build nanomachines and that endure over time. How is it possible that such complex structures in biology exist? And what is the role of entropy? Entropy should grow. The disorder of things used to be gross. Um, and yet we have uh, structures in the universe that manage to keep in a very complex structure for a period of time. And they even manage to reproduce and to keep longer before they, um, they're alive. Before, uh, so after they are alive, when they die, and when they finally disorder themselves and disappear. One branch of science that took off in the 20th century and only now is becoming important, complexity science, is about um, the interactions of little things, which is all the physics of nonlinear physics, complexity physics, all these things that happen when you have lots of things interacting with each other in different ways, in non-equilibrium systems where they're able to dissipate energy, you start creating patterns, you start creating structures. And over time, in certain conditions, this is what we think, some of these structures will start to endure, we don't know how. Some more complex organs, some more complex shapes will be forming. And eventually that created the capacity to replicate. Um, this was interesting to physicists and mathematicians in the 20th century, to Schrodinger, to von Neumann. I mean, all the foundations of modern computer science is based on um, these ideas of you create patterns in complex systems that dissipate energy, you create information, things that are able to replicate. So what we know is that also within the laws of physics is the fact that when you dissipate energy into the environment, you can decrease your entropy. So that's the origin of more complex molecules. And also that um, you can create complex structures out of uses of energy and information uh, to, to, perdure, to endure over time. You can create structures that are more complicated that last over time if you make the right use of energy and if you store enough information about your environment into the structure. Um, now, the complexity of we see now in biology is the product of billions of years of evolution. So another thing you need to understand to understand biology is that it's not enough to know the chemistry, it's not enough to know the physics or the maths, to, to recreate, imagine you know all the building blocks of um, something in your body. Um, you could still not be able to compute it with the right physics. Because what we're learning right now is in most cases, you need to take into account the evolutionary history of the, whatever biological structure you're studying on Earth to be able to compute the current shape. Because evolution selected certain possible answers to the question of life and is related, it relates us to all the other species on earth now and in, in the past. So one beautiful thing we're learning in biology right now is that to understand biology, you don't only need to face, for example, computer simulations like you do in a material or you don't face the problem like physicists normally do, you need to also take into account the physics of evolution. So in that sense, what we see now, the complexity we do now, is a combination of the universe being able to create complex structures that endure, and the interaction with the environment creates evolution, and that creates the complexity of the shapes we do now. And it's a complexity that is not independent from our environment. It always depends on what we have around us. But the most complex patterns in nature we have around are the patterns created by biological systems. Now, there's something very beautiful about biology. Um, of course, it's humans who are doing physics. It's humans who are doing mathematics. It's our structures that are able to interpret the universe, right? So these biological structures that we see around, they're rather complicated because they 
evolution over many years in this universe created shapes that endure over time. And one of the mysteries that as physicists we're trying to understand is why patterns have the shape they do and why we can understand these patterns in many physics and mathematics. So actually the origin of, um, uh, of, of, of why we look for patterns in nature is for looking at the complicated patterns that evolution has created making us uh, things that symmetry, why breaking symmetry, why symmetry is important, why symmetry is not important. So one of the lessons of evolution is, is teaching us that complex systems evolving on this in this universe create complicated patterns with interesting geometries, um, which have preoccupied physicists and mathematicians since a very long time ago. Is self-replication the fundamental principle of life? Yes, because if not, life would not endure. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we don't understand the physics of replication. We, um, this was the work of von Neumann a long time ago. Um, and now there's a new physicist called Jeremy England, um, who is trying to figure out um, the uh, thermodynamics of, of life. So the use of energy of life and why from an energetic point of view, replication is something the universe wants to happen. So his calculations, he's a theoretical physicist, and his calculations show that, um, uh, it, that a replicating a structure in terms of energy is favorable. So the universe, the, the laws of physics as we know them, will um, push a complicated enough structure into self-replicating to um, actually be uh, energetically viable. So you could see that in the early replicators. If you just have polymers such as RNA or DNA, one of the recent discoveries of science is that we all think the life might have started at RNA or DNA, actually might have started at mixtures of both. They could have been coexisted different polymers at the same time as usually is complexity. The interactions of complex systems give rise to patterns that eventually turn into something unexpected such as replication. But we, while we can understand the replication of a molecule, and people have also tried to understand replications of non-living things, uh, but um, from an energetic point of view makes sense. That's very far from the replication of a bacterium, which already requires a whole set to replicate. But one interesting thought, if you want to think about evolution, is that we are built, oh, we managed to create a planet in which complicated organisms like us can survive through mass extinctions and to creating, to shaping the whole planet. The whole planet was built to be able to hold complicated life by the previous extinction of microorganisms. So evolution is a kind of system of death and being alive. <laughs> I mean that until a system becomes stable enough to hold complicated life. Um, still, we're very far from understanding the complexity of evolution over billions of years. Um, that's why we don't understand replication. I think. So there are a number of these different hypotheses for the origin of life. Um, what physical observations can we make to obtain more information and try and answer the question of how life started and to test these different hypotheses? Well, people um, for a long time were recreating the primordial soup. I mean, I think it's called, so it's, it's, it's a mixture of chemicals that it was thought to happen in early life and bombarded with the sort of radiation and stuff and see what happens to see more complex chemistry being created. There are many chemists, there's one in Scotland, I can't remember his name now, uh, uh, that works a lot on the complex um, um, chemistry that can arise on Earth and that if life in other planets might arise from different chemistry. Um, so that's the pre-origin of life. You, you, you have a precondition to create complex enough structures. So that's the sort of things people do. These days, of course, we can use computer simulations also. 
um, to try to understand sort of mixtures of computers and 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 um, and chemical reactions. So people use computers to actually predict the chemistry and then get sort of the chemistry to happen according to your model. So we're going to see more and more interaction between simulations and all those models. Um, and still, I think the most interesting thing would be to find some kind of life in another planet or in, in another place to see what it's made of. Um, because we have nothing to compare with. That's why we're looking for Mars in, for, for life in Mars or in the moon of Europa, because it's very difficult um, um, to, to work in the hypothesis of the origin of life because it's a very complex system. And in complex systems, as you know, you can have many solutions of the complex system and it's difficult to know why. We don't know. What do you think are the chances of finding life on other planets? Uh, it, whatever we think is, is just an opinion, right? Um, yeah. uh, you know, you you know, we're all ve very excited about finding complex molecules in the in the atmosphere of Venus. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a still a wonderful mis mystery that why we have life on Earth, um, and because this is such a complex set of circumstances that we we, we don't know. If we can I, I think we will find it somewhere else. Because if the universe managed to find find conditions here to reduce entropy and create complexity, it probably has been found somewhere else. There's no uh, there's no logical reason to think, but they might still just be microbes. They might be very small things. I think might be the miracle of Earth is that over these billions of years of evolution, we created the conditions to create really complex life. Might be very complex life, might be more rare, we don't know. And my final question is, please could you tell us a bit more about your research and how it links with everything that we've spoken about today? I'm interested in, in, in biological shape. As I told you at the beginning of the conversation, one beautiful realization is the idea that um, out of the complexity comes out a shape, um, emerges actually, it's an emergent shape that contains information about the environment. And that, that shape is actually is the way that we survive. So I'm very interested about the shapes of, of living things. So I work, for example, in the shapes of tumors for obvious reasons. Um, we don't know how the tumors know how to create their shape and how the cells in a tumor create a different structure from the rest of our bodies. Uh, but I also work in a system that has always been from antiquity studied for shape, which is plants. So plants grow from a seed, um, if you think of uh, an archetype, a little weed, and then creates um, a little stem, the hypocotyl, and from there come the leaves. And these leaves, as we discussed before, usually have orientations between them, follow with magic angles. The reason for that is that they can collect more effectively the energy of the sun. So in my lab, for example, we are using a tool called the atomic force microscope. Which is a little microscope that measures mechanically the structures of things at the nanoscale. So we're using that to poke it very fast. And by doing that, we measure the energy stored, mechanical energy, because eventually to grow, you need mechanics, not chemistry. What you're doing is to grow physically or since a mechanical problem, materials. So they um, store energy and they dissipate energy. The most interesting thing is the dissipation. If you realize if we were elastic, there would not be life on Earth. What does it mean elastic? Elastic means instantaneous response. If life was instantaneous, time wouldn't move for us. If everything was instantaneous, if there was no energy dissipation, time would move forward. The reason time moves forward for us is because we dissipate energy into the environment. And by dissipating, we control the timing of things. So if you dissipate a lot of energy, you go slowly. If you dissipate a little energy, so time is controlled by the dissipation of mechanical energy for us. That's why time, metabolism, shape, the length of our lives is all scaling, all scales, because we're linking mechanics, chemistry, and shape, which is a rather beautiful thought. So we study this in plants and we try to understand how plants create their beautiful shapes 
by creating nanomechanical structures out of polymers, such as cellulose or pectin, where you make jam for. So the jam is to dissipate energy. The cellulose is very stiff, it's to be not dissipating energy. So by creating nanoscale structures that both dissipate and not dissipate in exactly the right way, they're perfect linear viscoelastic materials, which is amazing, the plants create their shape. So one of the things we have found out is that in order to create the, the growth conditions of a plant, you have very narrow windows in which you use the energy. It, we, we use something called the Onsager principle, which is what was used before. So you're just off equilibrium. So we are actually learning what are the energetics of biological shape. So if you want to create complex organisms, how do you utilize the energy from your metabolism and how you create materials in order to create your shape? And in the case of plants, they last for, you know, trees can last for hundreds of years. And I think this is also why it's interesting to be a physicist in biology, because physicists have always have this role between linking basic science with engineering. And I think in the case of biology, we don't only apply it to medicine, like in the case of tumors, uh, that we can use this knowledge about energy dissipation, energy stored to control the movement of drugs inside a tumor. That's something we're trying to do. Or we could even create bio-inspired materials. So this is an exciting area to do physics for, for many reasons. As you can see, the origin of life is one of the biggest unanswered questions, not only in physics, but in science in general. Understanding the origin of life will reveal precious information about who we are and why we are here. And at the same time, it will define the chances of finding life beyond our own planet. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to subscribe to the University of Oxford Department of Physics YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.